You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Do you remember making any New Year's resolutions? Think about what they were for a moment. Now, how's your progress with them? If you've achieved success, congratulations. Many of us, however, don't get very far with such goals. And because of that, we simply stop making them in the first place. What's the number one thing that keeps us from achieving our goals? Most of us will say it's willpower or the lack of it. At the same time, we can see that people who are able to use willpower effectively tend to lead happier, more satisfying lives. We tend to assume that willpower is hard. But in The Willpower Instinct, how self-control works, why it matters, and what you can do to get more out of it, psychology educator Kelly McGonigal argues that willpower is actually instinctual. It's a natural ability that we can all deploy successfully. But first, we have to know how it works. And this is where the book comes in. Her book was driven by the realization that much of what people believed about willpower was wrong. We tend to use old strategies that are not just ineffective, but counterproductive, leading to self-sabotage. But science has yielded plenty of new findings in the area, and a lot of them are counterintuitive. She felt it was her job to bring these to a wider audience. We'll now look at three broad areas from the willpower instinct. First, you'll learn the science of willpower. Its instinctual properties, gathered from a range of fields as diverse as paleoanthropology, neuroscience, and social science. Second, you'll get a grip on how and when you're most likely to lose self-control, give in to temptation, or give up your goals. Third, you'll learn about approaches that can strengthen the capacity for willpower. First, let's make sure we're all on the same page with what willpower is. Although most people probably consider it to be a torturous process of withholding some intense desire, resisting a piece of cake before you, trying not to go on social media, resisting a cigarette craving, it's not quite like that. Rather, McGonagall defines willpower as the ability to do what you really want to do when part of you really doesn't want to do it. Here's McGonagall in a Talks at Google. You could be the very same person, but depending on your mindset, depending on your energy, depending on your stress levels, your brain is going to meet this willpower challenge in a different way, and you're going to end up making you know, one choice today and one choice tomorrow. There are three kinds of willpower. The I will power, the ability to take action towards your goals. The I won't power, the ability to say no to actions that prevent you from achieving them. And then there's the I want power remembering what you really want and what your true goals are and separating them from other wants that may thwart them. Each of these are fundamental instincts, part of being human, McGonagall says. If we didn't possess the ability for self-control and to work towards goals using self-discipline, we would be a lot more animal and a lot less human. There was a time, however, before we evolved such traits. Our basic needs were sleep, food, sex, and avoiding predators. We were motivated not by verbalized, thought-out plans, but by simple urges like hunger, fear, and desire. These urges have not, however, disappeared. They're at the center of what's called the sympathetic nervous system and incite us towards action with potentially the same vigor as our ancestors. For example, take the fight-or-flight response. When confronted with an angry bear or a hostile person, the nervous system engages a brain center called the amygdala, that is, effectively, an alarm. Once this alarm goes off, our heart will pump blood faster, our eyes will widen, and we'll either fight the predator or run like hell. This response sequence evolved to be fast and automatic. It had to, or else we wouldn't be here today. This type of nervous reaction is highly relevant to willpower because it is exactly that, a reaction. Willpower, on the other hand, requires deliberate thought and action based on self-awareness self-control, intelligence, and planning ability. Our increased capability in these respects only evolved in time 
along with increases in social interaction. We learned the advantages of teamwork and social harmony. As we formed communities on increasing scales and our interactions with others became more complex, these abilities helped get more of the things we needed and desired. It became important to offer help to get it in return and to please and not anger those who could help you, like your family and friends. With the slow discovery of these advantages, our brains changed. Our ancestors evolved an area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex located behind our forehead, that underlies much of our willpower capacity. It helps us to consider the consequences of future actions by planning ahead. And since it's newer than the impulse reaction systems, like our amygdala alarm system, it evolved essentially to override such urges, facilitating better self-control. It allowed for more rewarding social interaction and the benefits that follow. We ultimately improved the neural architecture to both create complex goals and stay focused towards achieving them. The point is that we can capitalize on this new system we've inherited. Instead of being beholden to our ancient brains, we can take charge with instinctive responses characterized by self-control rather than reaction. In short, self-control is as much a part of our heritage as fight or flight. Willpower evolved to effectively protect us from ourselves. Or, as one of her chapter headings puts it, your body was born to resist cheesecake. Let's break for now. But before we go, let's recap what we've covered. We learned the three types of willpower. I can't, I won't, and I want. These represent three instinctual responses that make us human. We'll return to the willpower instinct next time. We'll learn how to identify willpower weaknesses. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're returning to Kelly McGonigal's best-selling self-help guide to mastering and understanding willpower. It's called The Willpower Instinct, How Self-Control Works, why it matters, and what you can do to get more out of it. Previously, we've gone over how willpower began as an instinctual social reaction. We also learned the three types of willpower, I will, I won't, and I want. This time, we'll learn how to master our willpower by understanding the weaknesses that arise due to willpower. To begin honing this instinctive capacity, we need to identify when we need willpower the most. That is, the moments when our thoughts and actions, or inactions, prevent us from reaching our goals. McGonagall defines these moments as being instances of internal conflict. These urges give us some kind of short-sighted satisfaction, but may not benefit us in the end. Here's McGonagall again in her talks at Google. And so a willpower challenge is anything where those two versions of yourself have competing goals. Part of you that really wants to eat a candy bar for your snack, and then there's a part of you that actually has some longer term goals. Both of these choices you might be drawn to by different, different parts of your mind or two different versions of yourself. Fending off temptation can be exhausting when you're already managing stressful aspects of your life, whether it's your job, challenging relationships, or finances. And when your energy is focused towards these ends, it doesn't leave you with the energy you might need for achieving other goals. It drains your willpower. Say, for example, that despite everything going on in your life, you devote some remaining willpower to an exercise routine. You've been at it successfully for three weeks. After the last workout, you feel a sense of achievement, although you're nowhere near your weight loss goal. On the way home, you stop at the grocery store to pick up some healthy food items, again, doing the right thing. But to get to the checkout, you have to pass those chocolate bars. Can you do it? You may feel that you've worked so hard, so you deserve it. You buy two, essentially putting back nearly all the calories you lost at the gym. McGonagall reveals that, surprisingly, it's precisely when you're feeling like a champion that you're likely to break down and act impulsively. When you're feeling virtuous, you're least likely to question impulsive urges. Thus, ironically, our very sense of achievement may undermine our ability to reach a goal that we truly desire. 
You say, I'm such a good person for not smoking. I've done so well with quitting and it's been such a difficult day. I'll just have one, only one. This moral licensing is often the final thought before you end up returning to your smoking addiction or the all-you-can-eat buffet. Or, as McGonagall puts it, when you feel like a saint, the idea of self-indulgence doesn't feel wrong. It feels right, like you earned it. She explains that if the only thing motivating your self-control is the desire to be a good person, of course you will give in when you achieve that and feel good about yourself. Sometimes, you don't even need an actual achievement to license an impulse or urge that is contrary to a goal. McGonagall provides a stunning example. When McDonald's introduced healthier options to their menu, Big Mac sales began to skyrocket. Why? Researchers concluded that it was the presentation of the mere opportunity to eat healthier that granted customers a sense of achievement, thereby giving them the excuse they needed to choose a Big Mac. Psychology research has given us another strange fact. People tend to overrate their abilities across a range of areas. We also know that individuals who rate themselves highest in self-control tend to be weakest at it in reality. So every time you hear a smoker confidently saying that they've quit forever, be skeptical. The more confident they are, the more skeptical you should be. This strange effect is linked to a related fact about willpower weakness. We tend to regard our future selves as having more virtue than our present selves. For example, in one study, students were asked to do something regrettable but important, emphasizing that it was to be done in the name of science. They were asked to drink a concoction of soy sauce and ketchup. The subjects could either delay the consumption of the drink by months or only by minutes. Most committed their future selves to drinking the concoction, in fact, double the amount of people in comparison to those who agreed to drink it within minutes. The point is, we tend to think of our future selves as improved selves. Thus, we fall into a willpower trap by rewarding our future selves for something we haven't done yet. There's another subtle willpower weakness that McGonagall discusses. In the 1950s, there was a series of experiments conducted with rats. Scientists thought they had discovered a pleasure center in the rats' brain. They trained them to press a lever to self-stimulate this region via a surgically implanted electrode. Sure enough, the rats zapped themselves to the point of exhaustion, even to the point they would injure themselves. Some years later, the hypothesized pleasure center was tested with humans, and the same effect was seen. At least one participant forcefully resisted the stimulation machine being turned off. Another kept frantically pressing the stimulation button. Clearly, the rats and the humans were all getting off on the same euphoric experience. Turns out, this wasn't actually true. What the scientists had done was tap into the brain region that stimulates the promise of reward or pleasure, rather than the pleasure itself. Indeed, with each press, they felt like they were getting closer and closer to something incredible, an elation like no other. But that's where it stopped. The euphoria itself never actually came. The researchers were simply stimulating their brain's reward system, which includes anticipation of reward. McGonagall's point is that there are plenty of things that we feel we are attached to for the pleasure they give, when in fact they're just exciting the reward system. The brain's reward system, which causes a release of the neurotransmitter dopamine, is stimulated by everything from the sight of lottery tickets and casino tables, to the smell of high sugar and high fat food, and to the sight of our smartphone. A little dopamine rush is often a button press away, just from the thought of doing or seeing something. A good example of this are the notifications we constantly get on our phones. Every time we hear a ping, this is often just as pleasing or exciting to us as the actual content of the notification. The reward system lies at the heart of addictive behaviors. Although it exists to motivate us towards action for the purpose of benefiting our lives, it can lead us on endless pursuits of satisfaction from places where there is none to be found. Even worse, McGonagall points to disturbing evidence that people who are trying the hardest to end an addiction can be most vulnerable to it. She describes a phenomenon called the what-the-hell effect. When someone slips up, say, having a cigarette when trying to quit, or having a drink when trying to drink less, it turns out that the more guilt, shame, and anguish they feel for such a failure, the more likely they'll do it again, without restriction. Why not? What the hell? You've already had one. Might as well let loose. 
All of these weaknesses McGonagall describes are important because they are not obvious. We've only discovered how they work via science and research. Next, we'll learn how she uses this science for self-help rather than self-sabotage. Let's break for now. But first, we'll recap. We've learned that the more confident you are at defeating a negative habit, the more likely you are to relapse. We succumb to moral licensing, allowing ourselves to break our willpower. We'll conclude our book insight on the willpower instinct next time. We'll finally learn how to grasp better control over our willpower. We'll end by discussing the book's impact and legacy. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our exploration into Kelly McGonigal's book on willpower. It's called The Willpower Instinct, How Self-Control Works, Why It Matters, and what you can do to get more out of it. Last time, we went over just what happens when we lose our willpower. When we're feeling like a champ, we're at our weakest in terms of willpower due to moral allowances. We'll end by discussing how to control your willpower to the fullest. We'll conclude with a brief look at the book's impact and legacy. Now that you have a better understanding of what willpower is, why we have it, and when you might be at your weakest, it's time to learn how you can use it more effectively. Let's start with a few ways to help safeguard against impulses, urges, and desires even before they strike. It's a fact that we're more likely to give in if we're tired, hungry, or stressed. One of the antidotes to stress that McGonagall recommends is meditation. Its benefits go beyond the relaxation felt during the process and actually helps to beef up willpower. Meditation brings increased attention spans, self-awareness, and an ability to ignore distractions. It increases neural connections in the prefrontal cortex, our center for self-control. Here's McGonagall again in her talks at Google. The number of minutes per day that people meditated also predicted resistance to relapse. There was getting more sleep, and both of these things, sleep and meditation, were, um, were giving people more willpower for one of the biggest willpower challenges. Perhaps, though, you've tried meditation and didn't get very far with it. Instead of freeing the mind of thoughts and distractions, exactly the opposite happens. You notice every thought and every distraction with even more intensity. But meditation can still be effective even if you are distracted. McGonagall describes one of her students who tried meditation only to discover just how distracted he could be. However, he kept practicing it and eventually noticed that it benefited his capacity for willpower throughout the day. Not only could meditation reduce his stress, he was more observant of when he lost focus in other tasks, ranging from sticking to a healthier choice on a menu to not blurting out a sarcastic comment when it was on the tip of his tongue. What meditation and mindfulness techniques tend to do is decrease heart rate variability, which McGonagall says is an index of willpower. This makes sense. When our sympathetic nervous system gets us going, our heart rate increases. This happens for every impulse and urge that excites us enough. Those who don't get excited are less likely to give in to whatever stimulus caused the excitement, be it the sight of a donut or an alert on our smartphone. If, physiologically, you don't get aroused, it's difficult to follow through with the action that relates to it. For example, it's been shown scientifically that alcoholics whose heart rate variability drops when they see a drink are less likely to start drinking again. In general, those who best maintain their heart rate in the face of distraction and temptation are better at resisting impulsive behaviors and so keeping to their goals. Another way to help decrease heart rate variability and thus increase willpower is exercise. Exercise increases brain connectivity and reduces stress. Importantly, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain related to self-control, shows the most significant changes as the result of exercise. McGonagall emphasizes that you don't need to run a marathon, do a spinning class, or even jog to reap the willpower benefits of exercise. Studies have found that the largest effects on mood and stress involved simple five-minute exercise sessions. Willpower itself may be regarded as a muscle that can be exercised. Studies have demonstrated 
that we can only focus for so long, ignore so many distractions, and resist so many temptations in a given day, especially if they're presented in quick succession. So how can you increase this reserve of willpower? One simple way is to actually treat your brain like a muscle. If it's tired, you're more likely to make impulsive decisions and think in the short term. So give it some sugar. Studies show that we're better able to exert self-control after a blood sugar boost that comes from a sugary treat, even if it's only a few Tic Tacs. Don't get carried away. The point is simply to make sure your body and brain are well-fueled when you need them to be. Another more direct and powerful method of increasing the willpower muscle is to start making small, seemingly inconsequential acts of willpower or willpower training. Taking minor yet consistent steps towards a goal can pave the way towards other goals. Examples include checking social media only at predetermined times or scheduling a time when you can eat sweets. Such simple acts can help you gain the willpower needed for other larger goals, ones that you may find yourself otherwise without the energy that you need. You can also motivate yourself by creating your own reward to look forward to once you've achieved a goal. Here, McGonagall references a reward system that has proven effective for those recovering from addiction. It's called the fishbowl. Upon passing a drug test, patients draw a piece of paper from the bowl. Half the papers simply contain a positive message like, keep it up. Other papers have a monetary amount written on them. Most are $1, some are $20, and the big kahuna prize is $100. The odds of winning at any kind of gambling or lottery are not in anyone's favor. Yet many keep coming back for another dopamine rush. The fishbowl lottery exploits addicts' tendencies to seek reward, but at the same time helps them stay away from drugs. One study found that 83% of the patients who had the opportunity to win the fishbowl lottery stayed to the end of a 12-week recovery program and were far less likely to relapse in comparison to other patients who did not have a chance to win money at the fishbowl. Having support from those around us can provide another key willpower advantage. If we surround ourselves with goal-positive people, it can have subtle but important differences. Messaging more often with a friend who enjoys the outdoors, for example, can get us to spend more time outside. Even using a picture that is goal-supportive on your computer or smartphone wallpaper can make a difference. McGonagall refers to a student who was determined to make it in med school. To help her stay focused, even just a bit, she had her computer's background set to a picture of a surgeon with her head photoshopped onto the body. The point is that willpower is contagious, and the more you look for it, the more you will find it. But all these willpower strategies are about staying motivated and focused. No matter how much determination we have, there will be times of temptation, urges, and cravings. We can't simply remove our amygdala or our dopamine-fueled reward system. Actually, one of the worst things you can do is try to ignore these tendencies. Research shows that if you try to ignore and shut out thoughts of any kind, this is a surefire recipe for making them stronger and more frequent. There's a technique called surfing the urge. It requires you to let yourself experience an urge and then contemplate it. Urges are often temporary and will likely go away within minutes. For example, considering a cigarette craving rather than trying to shut it out can actually be a more effective way of not giving into it. Taken together, these practices constitute effective measures for increasing willpower. Before we end, let's have a quick reminder of what willpower is. We learned that it's a mechanism that initially helped increase social interaction in a way that procured benefits for both individuals and communities. At a personal level, Willpower is humankind's greatest inheritance for accomplishing complex goals. We know that it helped us achieve better control over more primitive behaviors. On a higher level, it was willpower that helped build civilizations. Given all this, it was worth learning more about how willpower actually works in the brain and nervous system. The more we know, the easier it becomes to understand the urges which may sabotage us and replace them with actions that actually help us to achieve our goals. Now that you have a deeper understanding of willpower, you can put this knowledge into practice. Throughout the book, McGonagall offers easy-to-follow instructions on how to analyze both your willpower strengths and weaknesses, and find the practices that work best for you. Keep in mind, however, that McGonagall's suggestions are not simply her opinion. They're based on evidence from numerous studies. 
Beyond this, they've been tried by McGonagall's own students and further refined for the book. She admits that not all of them will work for you, but you should be able to find ones that do. So get interested in willpower and become your own researcher. Recall again your New Year's resolutions. Now you have greater, more effective ways for increasing the willpower needed for achieving them. You no longer need to feel weak. Plato once said, for a man to conquer himself is the first and noblest of all victories. You're now in control of your own self, and that's the beginning of all personal and professional success. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.